Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here to speak. I had spoken to Partho and Jadeep and others uh, on phone from Delhi and uh, I, I got to know also from the newspapers and other, other sources uh, what, of what, what was happening at this and this historic 26 day uh, long strike uh, was happening and this is something which stirred because I, I, I have been coming to this to speak uh, more in academic contexts but uh, for the last four or five years now, thanks to Partha, particularly Partha. Uh, but the fact, to, to hear that uh, you're on strike for issues which are so real and that you have been able to come together and take such a courageous and a collective step was uh, so inspiring for us in Delhi who are, as you know, in a very bad situation, particularly where I uh, teach um, in JNU. Uh, so it is not really I coming to talk to you, but more uh, the other way around, I coming to take your a little of your strength back to JNU to, to give us a little more courage and strength from take inspiration from you. And that really is, is what I have come here for. And uh, once I was here in the morning now, and I was talking to some of my old friends here, I am told, and that's so nice to hear, that today is a good day. I mean, strikes usually uh, are times of great difficulty, though, of course, in that difficulty, because of the very nature of the collective uh, uh, action and uh, the, the collective spirit, uh, there is so much joy and so much, so, so much enthusiasm and so much singing and so much thinking. Singing and thinking are not contradictory in a movement. Uh, that, that, that uh, is true, but at the same time, strikes also meet with tremendous amount of um, suppression and, 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 and hostility, of course, but also um, very devious tactics that administrations and governments and states, they adopt to put down a strike. But uh, through all that, from what I hear, uh, you have been able to actually overcome all these moves to put you down and today's a good day I'm told this today's a good day when funds have been released and some 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 uh, really uh, important uh, breakthroughs you have been able to make and I congratulate you on the fact and I take strength from you in the fact that you do not still back down you still hold on to the fundamental core of what you demand which is not just for yourself not just for your batch or the batches which are which are which are at the moment it is but for the future that i think is the uh, is, is the most uh, is the most profound level of political of, poli of, of 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 political commitment to commit yourself to the future and that you're able to do this is something tremendous and i really both congratulate you and 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 take inspiration from you uh, so so yes i'm very happy to come here on a good day I, I, because easily I could have come here on a bad day. If you came to JNU, you'd be coming there on really bad days. Uh, and I know that some of my, the people from TIS who are studying in JNU now, uh, they'll be probably talking to you and telling you what's happening there. Uh, but I'll not talk about JNU. During question answers, you can definitely ask me whatever you want to about what's happening there. Uh, but the fact is, and this is something in real terms, uh, is is something uh, which which is very different from how it was some, uh, uh, till even five years back. Uh, when I come to TIS, when I am in JNU, when I go to say the Calcutta Centre, the C Triple S C, I go sometimes uh, m meet people from HCU and other play IIT. Very importantly, IIT because IIT is uh, t uh, formally speaking the most uh, non-political or even anti-political establishment. IIT has no history of, at least institutionally, uh, of any space of politics. And at the same time, we know that some of the most significant and interesting new movements, uh, uh, which are both uh, political but also intellectually extremely, uh, uh, extremely important, are taking place in IIT. For instance, the uh, Periyar Ambedkar uh, study circle in Chennai, IIT Chennai. 
uh, which uh, uh, from which some of the most uh, important key debates uh, took place around Ambedkar and Ambedkar's thinking uh, and, and the force of that thinking vis-a-vis -vis an extremely big, bigoted uh, Hindu caste society. Uh, that took place because of, in two years back, uh, the, 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 the fact that the Ambedkar Periyar study circle in Chennai IIT came out with the truth of what Ambedkar, the, 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 ra the radicalness of Ambedkar view, Ambedkar's views about Hindu society and Hindu religion, which the mainstream establishment simply could not take. And that is not merely the so-called um, the Hindu right. It was also the liberal, the liberal part of uh, Indian society, which could not quite accept the radicalness of Ambedkar's thinking. And that came out because of the fact that uh, the Chennai IIT students, though in, a, in an otherwise extremely anti-political environment, were able to read, were able to read Ambedkar and bring it out in the public space. So, uh, so actually this, this kind of both political and intellectual alertness to the issues of social justice have been taking place now across the different educational institutes in the country. Very different from how it was when we were students, say I was a student of JNU, when uh, there were certain places like JNU, indeed JNU, uh, which were centers of politics and emancipatory radical politics, mostly dominated by a kind of left thinking, but there were centers around which a kind of periphery developed, so the center was always even in resistance dictating to the periphery. And to that extent, JNU would occupy the center and other institutions would be there, of course would be there, IIT was also part of that. In fact, at those days, IIT had a more strong political uh, groups were more present in IITs than they are now. But it was still dominated by only a few elite institutions and particularly JNU. That has changed substantially, radically now. And I think the reason for that is the new social movement, the new awareness, the new commitment to the idea of social justice. So social justice should not be taken as something which is, uh, which is to be taken for granted as part of uh, a, a general environment of politics which is of course uh, could be thought of in different ways or more or less falling in the same uh, range of colors. So it could be politics which is uh, part of the left politics or part of uh, certain kinds of uh, 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 movements which criticize uh, the, 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 status, the statism of certain mainstream political parties like BJP now and Congress earlier and so on. But social justice has another kind of depth and range and the issues of social justice have another kind of depth and range which goes beyond the mainstream representative politics which is visible in the spectacle of politics in Indian society. That I think is something which is a new threshold. And because we have been able to at least reach that new threshold, if not cross it, that traditional politics, formal politics and representative politics, partly electoral, but also partly politics of lobbying, negotiation and all of those things have had to take stock and have had to acknowledge that social politics or politics of society has a far greater depth and range and, and reach than only the formal space of representational politics can ever be able to, to accomplish in politics. I think that is a very important thing. And the, the reason that, or at least one of the reasons that this has been made possible is because of the initiative that has been taken by students in different educational institutes. And those educational institutes are not the elite institu institutions like JNU, for instance, which have dominated politics up to now. But of course, it's not a question of competition or contest between JNU and non-JNU and TIS and HCU and IITs, not at all. On the contrary, the interesting thing is, and this is something which, uh, you know, the people in JNU who I talk to, uh, many people I talk to, but uh, some of the people who are part of the social justice movement, particularly social justice movement, and not necessarily part of the traditional forms of left politics. They could be, but they might not be. Now, uh, one of the interesting things when you talk to them is, and I do talk to them, and they talk to me, and we talk and discuss and work together in, in many situations and difficult 
situations. So one of the most important things is that the priority is not anymore the so-called image of the institution. That is not the priority. So till now, somehow, radical politics contributed to the image of the institution's radicalness. So JNU, for instance, has always had, justifiably, a very radical image and radical politics was taking place there. And in a way, strangely, a kind of obsession started to be built that uh, we must we must preserve this kind of an image of JNU with, which must not be made into a normal mainstream conformist establishment which other as educational institutes uh, are. That kind of obsession with JNU identity or X identity or Y identity which are basically institutional identities has now changed a lot. Now, uh, social justice movements are saying that our interest is not in either X institution or Y institution. Our, institu our interest is in society. Our interest is in the fundamental, the fundamental truth, reality in which we exist, which is all of society. It is not isolated to a reputation or an image of a particular institution. It has to be now, this truth has to be told that, in, that social division, social hierarchy and social power is exercised everywhere, including in our institution. This, I think, is a major change in the discourse, in the way we have been talking within institutions, even radical institutions or radically oriented institutions like JNU. And in JNU, this has had a tremendous impact that now even within the institution, you must make a very strong critique, which is a social critique of the conditions in which the institution functions. So society is something which covers and overwhelms everything, including great institutions, which does not lessen their greatness, but which also does not make them above society. This, this new critical awareness and the courage to tell the critical truth about society as institutions function, within the functioning of institutions, has been made possible by social justice movements, which a certain kind of formal radical politics was not able to do. They were able to do it up to a point, but not able to do su sufficient. But now this, this new moment is here. And it is a terrific moment because what has happened is whether they liked it or not, I have seen this in the Calcutta Center, I have seen this in JNU and I have seen this elsewhere in TIS and HCU and other places and IITs. Everywhere everyone has to now acknowledge whether they like it or not that there is social inequality including in the classroom, including in the books, including in the teacher-student relationship including within the teacher-teacher relationship, including within the student-student relationship. This truth has to be faced even if you were, you know, earlier if this truth people knew, they would hush it up because they would say, oh, don't break the unity. Don't break the image of unity that, you know, we as a kind of, as a kind of political radicals possess. Now that kind of uh, mere image of unity is not going to suffice. Now we have to first tell the truth. That's the first move of real politics of social justice, which is to tell the truth about not justice or the idea of justice, that is easier in a way, but the reality of injustice. And that reality of injustice comes out both subjectively and objectively. So for instance, uh, on the question of minorities today, we know from the Sachar Committee report to other kinds of statistical uh, evidence that the minorities, particularly the Muslims in this country, have been consistently excluded from the institutional stakes and power of education as understood as some kind of symbolic cultural capital. How the Muslims have been excluded from that in every institution apart from, in a way, associating them subjectively now with certain kinds of institutions which are peculiarly called Muslim institutions. Now, because this is, this is the level of kind of 
kind of split in the in the identity of minorities vis-a-vis -vis education what has happened is when the new government has come bjp government has come which has an explicitly majoritarian agenda then they do the other thing they say oh it is because the minorities are inherently the the identity is between minority identity and minority institutional identity hence we must break this and make the minorities just like anyone else in a, any other institution so we will not have minority institutions at least i mean eventually we will we will we will have a formally equal institutions everywhere where no minority identity will be highlighted and everyone will be in that sense a neutral student irrespective of where you come from what your caste religion minority status gender or anything else is but you see this is of course a a a a, a tremendous a tremendous uh, devious tactic to take away the reality of minority exclusion historically and make it into a question of pure formal identity where when you are a student of an institution then you will only be the student of an institution and your social reality will be completely abstracted your religious the the kind of religious hegemony that particular religions exercise in society will be completely taken out of the educational logic so this is something that uh, dominates the thinking of the present government and its policies are fundamentally premised on a kind of neutralization a kind of how should one put it a kind of formal a formal definition of education that education is a pure form of becoming trained in society so that you are able to after your education become productive functionaries of that society so you can contribute to society by you know becoming entrepreneurs by becoming managers by becoming teachers by becoming whatever you become but basically it can be measured economically so that's why one of the models for this kind of educational uh, reform or thinking is that a student is a pure individual the student is not a community student is not a collective student is definitely not yet a social being the student is being trained to operate in society so family is society sure village is society sure even you know city life is society but once you enter the so called campus then you are not in society you are in some kind of a ground of being trained a kind of apprenticeship and so to that extent the moment you enter here it's so easy to project the ideology that oh you are not somebody who uh, can have a political organization or you shouldn't talk about caste you shouldn't talk about a religion because you are a student you are being trained to become a social functionary once you are in the social field we'll see what kind of realities you have to face but in so far as you are in a kind of privileged space of the campus you are a pure individual with no other concern with no other social stakes but to become trained to become productive in society so this is actually also what could be called a model which has come through western capitalism and all that where uh, basically a student is also a, a a person who can take loans that if you want to become educated you take loans from society that is that is that, that is banks you take loans and you become uh, a, a productive individual then you earn the money to return the loans and all your life you are concerned about paying back the costs of education and this is the ideology which justifies fundamentally the privatization of education where privatization means not just the privatization where there will be fee hike where there will be cuts in fellowships and scholarships but privatization means that you have a private existence as a student you do not have a collective public existence hence students are not political students must not be political but that is basically premised ki students are also not social student society is like a like a you know some kind of some kind of a, a college campus society so you can have college festivals you can have your hostel nights and you can have your little tea shop tea shop attas but those things must not become social discourse those things must not become political gestures in other words in slightly old you know old language they must not become a consciousness so students consciousness must be tautologically just students consciousness so you must be only conscious that i am a student 
which means what basically pass exams do well get your good grades yeah translate that into a good job get money so that you can pay back the money which society has eventually uh, as has supposedly lent you this is a model not that in india this has been implemented with the kind of capitalistic uh, uh, ruthless sort of a uh, drive that it's been implemented in in the west in india it's all uh, mixed up no doubt but still this is a this is a model this is a horizon which this government has taken the lead to push the economy and the and 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 the life of the student uh, in that towards that horizon with tremendous amount of force motivation and violence it is there in other parties also i don't think the congress has any other kind of vision but then this this government in particular the uh, at the center and this party has actually taken explicit steps to make its agenda clear that's why in a rush again and again in different institutions fees have been hiked in jnu it has happened in tis it has happened in other places and correlatively fellowships have been cut so while we are all fighting for the return of some kind of a uh, uh, a genuinely socially sensitive program for educational support for disadvantaged sections of society the fact is that even if through the pressure that you build on authority and they and it's a good thing that they have accepted now they've accepted and they have given you some uh, they have released some money that's a fantastic thing and it's because of your pressure that they have been able to do it but the model remains the same the model i don't think has has shifted yet the model remains that today we are doing it but tomorrow we'll go back to the private anti political self obsessed and fundamentally the indebted student the student is indebted both money wise and society wise so that's why i think it is fantastic that you will not merely give up on the past and the present you will also not give up on the future that you will say that even for the future we do not accept your model we do not accept your vision we have a different vision and at that level i think across this country now students are asserting not merely their student hood a kind of romantic idea that students are idealists you know i have heard this from when i was a student or even before that the students to bahut idealistic hote hai na us umar mein wo sochte umar ka ho jata hai it's a kind of what someone called socio hormonal idea yeah You know? कि उस उम्र में ऐसा होता है बड़े हो जाएंगे तो सब ठीक हो जाएगा खुद बखुद तो फैक्ट को यह और दिखाता है फैक्ट हम हमें कहीं और ले जाता है फैक्ट अगर देखें तो स्टूडेंट्स सबसे रियल होते हैं क्यों रियल होते हैं क्योंकि उनको रियलिटी को सबकी सबसे ब्रूटल और डिफिकल्ट जो उसका उसका जो आयाम है उसका जो डायमेंशन है दे हैव टू कंटेंट विद दैट सो फॉर इंस्टेंस आप लोगों को हॉस्टल में रहना पड़ता है मैं भी रह चुका हूं अब मैं रहता हूं एक क्योंकि मेरे पास सैलरी मुझे मिलती है मेरे लिए संभव है तो मैं आई लिव इन अ प्लेस वेद एज एन ए सी एंड इन डेली यू नो फोर्टी सेवन डिग्रीज और वट एवर ए सी है तो इवन इफ लाइफ इज डिफिकल्ट ड्यूरिंग समर विथ ऑल का आई कैन कम इन टू एन ए सी एंड आई कैन एटलीस्ट फॉर half an hour or one hour or at night get so to speak literally physical comfort to come to 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 recuperate to pr so called produce in society to go back and be productive at the same time when i think of a student in the same 46 degree delhi summer and then goes to a hostel room and forget an ac even a cooler even a even a even a desert cooler sometimes becomes a problem because the the administration comes and says oh this is increasing the electricity bills which we can't afford and you, you have to pay for electricity bills and uh, anyway it's very difficult to calculate how much who should pay because why should someone else pay for your cooler so even coolers are sometimes banned which is the most i mean banal and cruel thing you can ever do it's a very banal example but it's a very real example yeah so at that very banal everyday level students are exposed to anything but idealism they are exposed to reality they are exposed to material reality physical reality 
meteorological reality, seasonal reality, which the upper classes, the upper classes, precisely because they have proved themselves to be uh, to to be uh, sufficiently obedient to the ideology of mainstream society which includes in our country both brahmanical mainstream and the capitalistic mainstream and most most of all they turn out to be the same for a reason which we can discuss but whatever so because the the people from our class have shown obedience hence they are being now rewarded they are in the domain of us they can afford to be idealistic so they can say oh things are not so bad Oh, it's okay. I mean, uh, sometimes these things happen, but eventually, uh, after demonetization, a certain class will say, it is all in the long run good. So, uh, you know, John Maynard Keynes, the economist has said about short run and long run in economics, in the long run, we are all dead. But after demonetization, the fact is, even in the short run, we are in danger of dying. Yeah, yeah. So even the formal parameter of economics has changed with demonetization. So people who are vulnerable, student is just one example, but uh, you know people who are what would be technically called the precarious class of society, a kind of precarious proletariat, a precarious shudra, basically daily wage workers, basically the people who have to provide service as the Shudra traditionally through the Manuspriti is meant to provide to the upper castes. Basically provide service, provide labor, provide those comforts which the upper classes and upper castes can enjoy. Those, those people after demonetization, actually their reality was exposed by demonetization. So demonetization, monstrous as it was, actually exposed the reality of society that the formal economy is the true idealism. It is idealistic in the sense that you, you, it is idealistic in the violent sense that I will impose the idea that there is a formal economy and everyone must enter the formal economy, including the student. While the reality is that the non-formal real part of the population vulnerable and precarious part of the population, including the student. So the student is divided between the formal violent ideal that you must be this pure careerist, self-obsessed student who will become uh, a successful, uh, you know, uh, an, an individual in life and the real reality of the student who collectively face the most difficult part of uh, human life as they are growing up. This is sought to be covered over by both the so-called model of a certain kind of uh, education understood as apprenticeship, purely oriented to the individual student as a subject and the subjective side, uh, which actually is what, you know, uh, is, 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 is uh, enunciated or is brought out as the cynical patronizing discourse ki jas jab bade ho to samjhoge. Abhi ye sab kar lo, but uh, uh, ek bar bade ho ge, to khud ba khud ye cheeze uh, apne usse nikal jayenge. Aap lo, matlab, aap lo ki karo ge nahi, ye, ye uh, politics ke baare mein baat aur social justice ke baare mein baat, ye sab aap karo ge nahi, kyunki kya hoga, and they have, they have a very, uh, very pinpointed reason for saying this, a blackmail, ki we will make, will force you to look after your own interests so badly and so so minutely that you will have no time for anything else. So it will put such pressure on you, the pressure of life, that you will have no time for anything else, to think of society as such. So this is the blackmail. But this dark and devious picture is again and again being torn apart by the real movements of real people, including the students. And in the recent past, Mumbai, Bombay is, I think, a tremendous center and an inspiring center of such, of such a, a refusal to be captured by the thinking and the vision and the model of, uh, of the state 
of the state and uh, the, 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 the governments of the different parties, including the, the, the main party, which is the BJP. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, now, now uh, why is Mumbai such an inspiring center? For the obvious reason that you people are agitating here. The farmers came to Mumbai and they encircled the city in such a way that it was not actually understood to be, I mean, I, when the farmers' agitation was taking place and they came to Mumbai, they walked to Mumbai, then uh, I, I was wondering how this, the, uh, through the media, uh, it would be shown how the city reacted. And, uh, you know, some of the newspapers in Delhi, when even a chota uh, demonstration happens, uh, the next day the news is that traffic was blocked. The city went through such problems. As if these political agitators who are not on other planets. These troublemakers who come from some other world, while we live in the normal world, the normal world of career, pesa, air conditioning, and so on. But Bombay has recent past me is cheese ko demolish katiya. At least media reports khud they had to acknowledge that actually when the farmers came in, then the not so to speak the ones who are not farmers but the ordinary people of the city they responded with open arms. They responded with a kind of collective solidarity, a collective spirit of some kind of, if not complete, of complete uh, agreement with everything that's going on. Uh, but at least the sense that some injustice is something, some unjust reality uh, is, is something which, which, uh, in which all of us are included. Something is rotten. Something is rotten. And to that extent, the city and the people did not behave like the way the city is supposed to behave, which is selfishly, self-obsessively. But instead, instead, <coughs> the city behaved in such a way that it turned out to be not just a sociological reality, a city, so to speak, or an urban space, but uh, the, the truth of such a thing, which is a collectivity, which is which is which which is which is a kind of a, a kind of public a, 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 a public political solidarity but i also thought that it is in this city that kuchhi din pehle Bhima Koregaon had happened. So actually one cannot be complacent with this picture or that picture. No one can be complacent. All politics is in a sense based on situations and situations are changing. And in, 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 uh, in the context of Bhima Koregaon, there was again some kind of an atmosphere, again something I've only read, I was not here at that time, but, but, but an atmosphere which was a, a kind of adversarial, polarized atmosphere at some level. So, that, that, that is the important thing. That actually at every moment, any kind of place, any kind of city, any kind of context is being constantly divided between its different sections but also different political subjects. And at what point, which way the balance will go, you can never tell. In that context, uh, it seems to me, that uh, two things that uh, 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 and this is something which I felt when I was talking to some of the students now and some of the faculty who, who are my old friends now that uh, this has been able to uh, shift the balance towards a, 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 a more robust a more uh, a, 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 a more collectively emancipatory side by this agitation and I heard that Prakash Ambedkar had also come other political uh, other political groups and parties have also shown interest in what you are doing and this in a way shows that politics, even politics initiated by extremely self-seeking, cynical political organizations uh, which are mainstream organizations are, are vulnerable to being forced to take emancipatory and socially progressive positions when they are forced by a real agitation and this has contributed to that and that is something which uh, is uh, which is tremendous which is fantastic 
Uh, this is the first point. But the second point is that at the level of the of an institution like this, with the question of social justice being the main question or one of the main questions around which this agitation is taking place because the, the, the SCST uh, fellowships cut and the idea that uh, the, the, the money that uh, the government gives is now to be entirely calculated in terms of individual benefit and not in terms of social justice. So the idea of social justice must be thought about very seriously. That is social justice social or is it social justice as only a kind of um, arithmetical summation of individual cases? This in a sense is the test for how a educational institution or a campus or students respond to how the state wants you to respond. So the state clearly wants to make social justice not social justice but a kind of peculiar individual social justice. This is the state's move. So you will have scholarship programs, fellowship programs, not only for institutions, actually institutional fellowships will be cut. But there will be fellowship programs which will be the government's initiative and the Prime Minister will take pride in that, which will be, uh, say, there will be an essay competition. And probably that essay competition will be an essay on social justice. And it will be opened up to, uh, the large uh, to, the, to, to the large part of the disadvantaged communities of the country. But what will happen after that is, some of these essays will be awarded as the best essays. And those particular individuals will be given maybe a scholarship for their further education up to, uh, up to their research or whatever level. Now, while it is true that it is a tremendous help to the individual student when he or she gets this kind of support, the ideology here, the move here is very, very insidious. The move here is that we will break down the collective reality of a community, we'll break down the historical reality of a community and communities, but make it a question of individual achievement. So this is also a way of reconciling both the idea of merit and the idea of social justice. So if you, if you spoke of social justice in a radical sense, then social justice is, is a demand. It is a historical social demand. But the state will always look at it as not a demand, but a petition. See, there is a difference between a demand and a petition. A petition is a kind of urgent request. authority colonial times colonial times even congress initially was a petitioning organization so aap queen ko colonial authorities ko petition karte the ki hamari community hamara gaon hamare even ghar kisi ke khas apne ghar mein family mein koi dikkat hai to aap directly queen ke paas ek chitthi likhte ho ki hamari family mein dikkat hai hum aapko petition karte hain aapko urgently request karte hain ki aap kuch hame madad kijiye intervene kijiye lekin militant organization ek aur cheez hoti hai so congress at some point actually became within its own limitations which is a nationalist brahmanical ideology but still technically strategically militant how militant organizations are those organizations which say that we demand of the authority because it is our right that you deliver justice to us if you don't then we will impose sanctions on you not state impose sanctions on the people that state has the power to do but people can impose sanctions on the state this is a militant organization. So, an organization which is truly democratic, and militant organization shouldn't be confused with any kind of violent, uh, violent path. It, violent path is a different issue. We can discuss it separately. Militant organization is an organization which does not request but demand. And it demands because it does not make it an affair of the individual. The individual family, the individual person, the individual gown, the individual community. It makes it a an affair of the society itself. So when a person from a particular Dalit caste speaks of his or her historical and contemporary deprivation, then he or she is not speaking as a petitioner. He or she is speaking as a militant. 
and he or she is speaking as a militant because he or she is making the demand on behalf of all of society. All of society is at stake when an individual wrong is being sought to be rectified and justice is sought. So injustice, when we speak of social injustice, we must include in the meaning of social injustice what I will call fundamental injustice. Fundamental injustice means okay, the injustice pertaining to the assumption in society that society may alag alag individuals ke alag alag privileges ho sakte. Now the problem in the case of education is this kind of privileging is actually justified by the idea of merit, by the idea of an exam-centered, career-centered, evaluative, quantitative, almost money, money-driven education system where everything can be monetized, everything can be calculated in terms of how much you're contributing and how much we'll give to you. This is the ideology which very, very neatly fits both into the Brahmanical trajectory and the capitalistic trajectory. Now, some people will say, and some of my uh, uh, old, old, old uh, uh, political comrades, for instance, Chandravan Prasad, <coughs> many years back when uh, we were all working together in JNU, he would say that, no, this is not true. The Brahmanical idea of education privileges the Brahman. <coughs> privileges privileges the, the caste which is traditionally given the right of education, the privilege of education, which is the Brahmars. The Dalits and even the, the other Shudra castes, they are not given that privilege. So to that extent, capitalism, at least at some level, opens the market for everybody. Uh, now, it might sound true and probably at some level this is a, this is a position one can, you know, uh, one can... Uh, partly, partly, uh, partly understand. But we must also take very seriously the fact that what we call the market, what we call the modern economic education system, so it's not an education system, it's an economic education system. This is a system which is based on one and one rule only, which is to market inequality, which is to capitalize the very conditions that exist in society it is not to make first society formally equal and then make capitalism, then make market economy. No. It is to market the society as it exists. Market the very contradictions of society. So even if there is social contradiction and economic contradiction, capitalism or the educational economic system will not go back. It will still come forward to say we will make money out of this inequality. That's why that's why the executives, the upper echelons of the bureaucracy, of CEOs and all of that is mostly dominated by the upper castes. Because these companies, the market, has basically invested the existing power which the Brahmanical classes and castes already possessed. So in, when you bring this to the educational field in the classroom, what happens? Now, one, one logic is, and it is, a, it is a completely important logic to follow, that we must break the Brahmanical hegemony within the classroom. Both in the relationships of people, but also in the knowledge. So absolutely true. Till now, the priestly class has, has had a monopoly over education, you know, over learning, over knowledge, and this must be redistributed, and this must be equalized, the hegemony must break. But, there is one thing we must not forget that this so-called hegemony or hegemonic redistribution is still based on the assumption that the field of knowledge remains the same and that is a Brahmanical field of knowledge. So what, you know, one sociologist called Pierre Bourdieu called symbolic capital or cultural capital or capital, basically capital, in the Indian context is the Brahmanical capital. So Brahm Brahminism is also capital. Capital for these people to invest from which clearly the non-Brahmanical castes and classes will be excluded. So will we correct the social field to then bring in true economic, uh, formal capitalistic relations? No way. No way. Capitalism must make money yesterday. 
not today or tomorrow. It, it is supposed to have made all its money even before all this began. So they will invest what is there, what is in front of them. So to that extent, I think it is it is not a surprise that the, the, the economic system is highly uh, capitalistic in education, but the education as a content is highly Brahmanical. So one of the most important, more than an institutional move to be made or step to be taken is to break the Brahmanical nature of the educational content. The Brahmanical nature of the educational field, the symbolic capital. So it is not enough to only fight for hegemony within the same symbolic capital. It is also to change the very nature of the symbol. And that's why I am completely in favor of what is called a new methodology in education. So even in JNU this debate happened or has been happening, say in the study of history. So some of the Dalit students and other students spoke of a Ambedkarite Pule method of looking at history. And some others responded that, look, uh, we understand your passion. We are with you. We are, we, in fact, we support your passion. But education must be methodologically uh, not subjective. It must not be Ambedkarite or Pule or anything. It must be pure science. It must be scientific. It must be built on a kind of neutral, formal field of knowledge. Of which, of course, Ambedkar can be a part. Now, of course, even quantitatively speaking, how much Ambedkar is taught in the university is another question. With all the public recognition of Ambedkar today, in the actual teaching of Ambedkar, a very small part of Ambedkar is in JNU library, there's still not the collection of Ambedkar's works. It is so terrible. So forget that. But even as an idea that any kind of knowledge has to be built on some sort of a neutral method, or a neutral site itself belongs to the individualist thinking of the educational discourse of knowledge itself. That knowledge is not based on a decision to adopt a new position. Even so-called modern science wouldn't have been possible if at, uh, you know, at one point some mathematicians and some scientists had not taken the risk that nature operates differently, not having found out what exactly nature did but having made a decision, having had the vision that it is possible to think of nature scientifically and not theological. Which then proved correct. Which then proved experimentally correct. So to that extent, society, and Amitka was the first one to support that, society is, has to be looked at scientifically. But science is a matter of courage. Science is not a matter of statistical neutralization. Now this is something which uh, comes down back to the question of something like uh, a measurable a measurable knowledge which is then which then trickles down from something like the existent elites to the lower part of society Pule in his great text uh, Gulamgiri uh, made, made a very important criticism against the colonial against the colonial education. Though he himself, as you all know, in content-wise, uh, thought of colonial education as an opportunity to learn some new scientific methods instead of the, the, the tremendously mythical, superstitious lines of Brahmanical thinking. But he still made a criticism. What was that criticism? It was the same criticism. He said that the colonial, uh, the British colonial uh, educationists are missing an opportunity to bring a new sight to education in Indian society. Because when they bring the so-called Western liberal education, what do they do? They go to the Brahmas. They go to those who in the traditional setup are already privileged and powerful in terms of being the educated elite. And they go to those same people. And Pula said that, look, why will they learn what you're trying to teach them? Because they're already steeped in their own complacent Brahmanical field of what they think is the truth or true education or true learning. Basically Pandit, Pandit. They are Pandits. They already think of themselves as Pandits. Or Naya Pandit kya banaoge unka tum? First problem. Second problem is that jo log hai jin ke, jin se, jin ko education se bahar kiya gaya hai. Jo privilege nahi hai. 
वो अगर उनको कोई नई नया एजुकेशन एज नॉट टूल मेयरली बट एज वेपन हथियार मिलेगा तो वो तो है ना जो एजुकेशन को रेवोल्यूशनाइज करेंगे सोसाइटी में सोसाइटी विल बी रेवोल्यूशनाइज बेन यू एजुकेशन लेकिन आपने यानी कि ब्रिटिशर्स ने यह नहीं किया क्योंकि क्लियरली ब्रिटिशर्स वर नॉट इंटरेस्टेड इन रेवोल्यूशनाइजिंग सोसाइटी ऑन द कॉन्ट्री दे वर इंटरेस्टेड इन कीपिंग सोसाइटी एग्जैक्टली द वे इट वॉज एंड इवन एग्जैसरबेटिंग द हेर आर्किस बिकॉज दे वॉन्टेड अ फंक्शनिंग प्रोडक्टिव क्लास नाउ दिस डज नॉट मीन वॉट इज हैपनिंग टूडे इज सिंपली अ रिजल्ट ऑफ कलोनियल लॉजिक it is a logic of the colonial appropriation of brahmanism so it is a completely uh, motivated and wrong thesis to say ke caste was invented by colonialism of course colonialism was in that sense a kind of proto capitalism it invested caste it capitalized caste it circulated caste but it did not create caste in the way that some post colonial scholars want to advertise uh, 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 advertise a certain kind of Uh, anti-colonial easy politics so pule pule and then ambedkar they are the people who you have to learn and read and understand not merely because of a slogan not merely because of tokenism not merely because you are forced to do so because of the sheer power of ambedkarite uh, thinking today but because it is the only available new social critique the critique of looking at society through the categories of justice and injustice including in your own field which is education and the last thing that i want to say today is something which i heard again yesterday which was something we all know and the person is with us as he always is and has been since he was since he disappeared he has been with us which is rohit rohit vamula and his letter yesterday i saw a play by sunil shanbag in iit very 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 interesting play in which uh, the play is called uh, when uh, words words are already uttered in which they were reading from different letters and texts of dissent in in not just india but world history and uh, one such letter was uh, rohit's letter and uh, and and i heard that letter being read out again so so jab wo chitthi i mean of course sub everyone was moved to tears nearly jab wo chitthi phir se padhi gayi lekin shall i be frank with you it is true ki pichle 4 saal mein social justice movements have spearheaded really a new consciousness a new collective spirit Uh, which is revolutionary and in a way everyone is riding on that revolutionary spirit and what i call demand not petition but demand no doubt about it and yet i think we are still not we are still not at the level of what rohit wrote we still are not able to come up to that level we are still not able to meet rohit's words and the meaning they contain in uh, this otherwise tremendous moment of upsurge across different parts of the country in our society why why am i saying this because something in that letter not only spoke about his condition as an individual which has to do with the which is very real to which all of all of you or many of you would relate which is deprivation physical material deprivation of fellowship of hostel also the fact that what rohit wrote was to do with some kind of a gesture of saying farewell to his friends particularly his friends and in a way doing which only a true friend does which is to free his friends from himself when he is not going to be there so again and again he tells his friends do not do not feel me as some kind of a some sort of burden the burden of what happened to me why did i do what i did free yourself of me 
this only a very very great person can do i mean there's no no one can doubt that so he wrote that so these of course are immortal almost immortal lines immortal things that he said and uh, it, it it has a kind of poetic genius to them but there is also the question that he raises which is a kind of philosophical question about society as such and which is this when he says that never was man taken to be a mind what does he mean by that what could he mean by that because he is not here to tell us what he meant and yet those words shine those words are not obscure never was man the human being taken to be a mind now at that level there is something in that letter which really it doesn't challenge us in the competitive spirit but it it urges us it uh, it it uh, it makes us become silent for a moment that there is something to think here about our vision of justice not simply as a correction not simply as a rectification of a state of injustice but justice is something which is more than policy something which is more than a mathematical a mathematical uh, 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 modification of numbers but something which is affirmation something which is a vision i think what that vision is is something we are still struggling with rohit had a vision and we are struggling for that vision and to that extent of course we really need him or someone like him to give us that vision ambedkar is there and only ambedkar is there or pule is there because of what because of their texts because of the 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 treatises because the vision is now available to us for us to read and rohit's letter is also available us to for us to read but eventually we have to do it ourselves we have to speak in our voices and we have to tell ourselves we have to whisper to ourselves we have to shout to ourselves what our vision is of a society of collective living of how to become not just militants of of justice against injustice but also what in buddha and his dhamma ambedkar called or would call something like a subject of what he called vinay a something like a new civility a, a new disposition a new way of conducting our bodies so, so that our bodies don't give out signs of so you know injustice is something which is which is the message that our bodies give out so when you when 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 you meet a person who has an attitude of of inequality to you attitude of injustice towards you then you can see it even before he or she has said anything you can see it it is a message that the body gives out in ambedkar in buddha and in buddha and his dhamma it seems to me is asking us to nearly create new bodies for ourselves and when rohit says man was never a mind then this mind is not a mind in some uh, in some far away abstract exotic sense this mind is a kind of new body a body which is not simply you know the shudra idea of shantha the last thing i'm saying the idea of shudra and manusmriti was what the idea of shudra and manusmriti was that the shudra would serve without the word that is used in sanskrit is anusua without resentment what does that mean just think about it aap surf karte rahoge dusron ka kaam karte rahoge lekin zara bhi aisa nahi lagna chahiye ki aap dukhe ho rahe ho ki aap thak rahe ho ki aapko gussa aa raha hai aap surf bhi karoge aur aap is tarah ka message doge apne gesture se apne body se apne aap se 
کہ آپ اس چیز میں اس چیز کو کرتے ہوئے بڑے خوش ہو پتہ نہیں کیا ہو لیکن جو بھی ہو دکھی نہیں یہ اس کا کیا مطلب اس کا مطلب ہے یو آر ٹرائنگ ٹو کنٹرول ناٹ جسٹ یور لیبر بٹ یور سیلف یور مائنڈ بٹ دا مائنڈ از نتھنگ بٹ دا باڈی ان سو فار از دا باڈی گیوز یو دیٹ میسج دیٹ آئی اوبے یو آئی لو یو آور ٹیچرس ار سینگ ٹو یور اسٹوڈنٹس وی ول ڈو وٹ ایو ول ڈو بٹ یو مس لو اس نا دس آئی تھنک is where so one 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 answer to this is militant that we do not love you yeah it could even go to the extent we hate you yes even that moment will come and has come but with rohit and with ambedkar and with many others surely there is that difficult and yet beautiful vision of something which is a new civility a new message of the body a new sign of the body and that i think is uh, where something like an agitation something like what we are doing here today and what you have been doing for so long and what we are doing in jnu despite the fact that it is the worst time and the most difficult time and it could get worse for all you know or it could get better like today at least this is a as i said it's a good day that i'm coming to test today but irrespective of that there is something here that is going on that is also beyond its militant demands beyond its uh, specific its specific uh, uh, it's, it's its specific points all those points and yet something more than that which is what which is us which is you which is the fact that you are also demanding of yourself you are also asking yourself you are also telling yourself you are also whispering to each other and your own self you are also insisting that you become and we become someone else and that is what i am calling not only social but something which is fundamental this can also be called of kind of fundamental humanity so to become human in this sense which is not a social which is not individualistic which is not career oriented which is not simply you know uh, uh, some kind of religious duty of doing charity to others but being and becoming human while doing something which is political and agitational that i think is um, both political but at the same time uh, not political only in the sense of uh, in in sense of Uh, oppositional politics but in the oppositional politics also making yourself the both the words the the the, the content the the sense of your politics but also someone who uh, is listening to yourself and becoming someone else and to that extent the meaning of a collective the meaning of all of us together uh, and my own coming here is always a question of uh, of mm, as i speak wanting to listen to you but even to listen to myself in the sense that uh, uh, again the 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 way rohit wrote in his solitude you see this is something which which i keep which uh, which i which i keep uh, thinking about that he wrote in solitude and what he did after that can only happen in solitude and in his case it was a solitary solitude and it could only be a solitary solitude which we the very next year and i peculiarly i was in i was in tis that day when we heard what had happened to rohit or what rohit did to himself or was done to by society all of these but i was in tis that day but it was it was something which which which, which was which was this we explosion that came came out of the solitary solitude when he was not there anymore but what he has left us with is something which is equally important for us in which we must do politics in which we must demand in which we must speak and shout the name of justice and shout against injustice and that is what i'll call an l and i will end with that which i will call public solitude
So after Rohit, we can only be alone and we can only be alone in public. Thank you. As one basic things which is put to institutes like JNU and is uh, this these are just islands where <coughs> these moments and these realizations are happening. But on the out the outside the campus, uh, especially the political scenario uh, is entirely the opposite which is happening. So don't you think this is still limited to these islands? Why is it not moving out of these islands? So. Uh, I just want to hear from you regarding this. Uh, I, I, I completely uh, uh, appreciate uh, the, why you are in a hurry, why you want it to go outside. But what I am saying is, yes, you are right, that it is not going outside in the way we would like it to go outside. And the outside is not coming uh, to us in the way we would like the outside to come to us. But my point is that the nature of the struggles today and the agitations today is somewhat uh, different from certain kinds of uh, autonomous but uh, but but local local movements or island uh, kind of movements in Tisojeni or wherever else uh, because uh, insofar as these 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 issues are are, are articulated in the language not of uh, merely uh, formal democratic politics or, or representative politics or electoral politics or even a, a, a kind of rhetoric of uh, revolutionary politics. But these are articulated in concrete social terms, in terms of a question. That's what I tried to uh, speak of, about today, that when one person's fellowship is in question, like Rohit's was, then it is not a question of that person in the way that the state would like it to be. So state would say, what has state said with Rohit? No. If Rohit was around, they would say, and Rohit turned out to be this, uh, this, this star in, in, in not uh, in the sense of a celebrity, but it, today he is peculiarly a celebrity, uh, you know, in a, in a very, uh, which makes you shudder, because the word celebrity comes from 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 a foreign land, but at the same time he's a star in the sense stardust. That's that's what he said, no, stardust, star. Yeah, but suppose he. He, he was he was he was alive and his stardom came out. Then what would the state say? They say, of course we're going to award you. We're going to give you everything. But you only you, because you seem to be someone special. So Ambedkar, Ambedkar is somebody who everyone wants to have a piece of. Everyone wants to appropriate. Every program is done in the name of Ambedkar. And at the same time, when it comes to the question of. Uh, real political consequence, social consequence, then whether it's Rohit or it's Ambedkar or whoever else, all of them are objects of not just fear, but hate. They, so with Rohit, they reveal themselves, they said, oh, but he is not a SCist. He is not a SC. Because the, uh, the two castes of his mother and father, I mean, imagine the kind of the kind of brazen, shameless self, it's not humiliating Rohit, it's to humiliate intelligence, humiliate uh, the, 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 the dignity of the struggle, humiliate the person's words. But they could do it because they want to reduce everything to the individual, to the case, to, to the state's manipulation. Whether the manipulation leads to something extremely unjust and oppressive and and you know something uh, which is uh, which is a victimization or it leads to patron patronage either way but it's manipulation against that the critics that students the criticism that students are building today is a collective social criticism they are saying no we are not simply individual students who have their individual grievances about which we are putting whether a petition or a demand. We are doing it in the name of, of course, Dalit identity, Dalit politics, Dalit history, but also in the name of the very meaning of society. Again, Ambedkar is, is where we must, we must uh, go again to read him. What did Ambedkar say? Ambedkar said Hindu society is not a society because Hindu society is a contradiction. Hindu society is a society which 
curses, it's a, he used a very strange, difficult English word. He said anathema. Hindu society is anathema. Means it's a curse. Anathema means something like a curse, no? Hindu society doesn't merely curse the Dalit. It doesn't merely curse Muslims. It doesn't merely curse women. It curses itself. And then it is not a society. So what did Ambedkar speak of? He spoke of what he called, and this is what I was trying to say at the end. I can't say it so well as Ambedkar can. So Ambedkar spoke of social humanity. This vision, this fundamental vision that I was trying to clumsily talk of, is a kind of social humanity, which Hindu society blocks. So that's why society instead of Hindu society, not this society or that society, but society for the first time, this, I think, in a small way, but in also in a, in, a, in a fantastic way. But of course, we must not become complacent. We must not become, uh, you know, satisfied with ourselves. I, I agree with you there. But still, this is a new level and a new, uh, uh, a new orientation of students' political language and thinking, which is, which is oriented to criticizing a kind of society, whether Hindu or any other kind of society, to then affirm society for the first time. This, I don't think, has happened before, at least in JNU it has not happened. About this, I have no right to speak. But in JNU, with all JNUs, all of JNUs, wonderful, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, inspiring uh, stories from the past, of which I have also been a beneficiary, but it has not been ever, forget, been able, it has not even thought it worthwhile to think of society for the first time. This I think the students are doing. It is not a small thing. And you can only think of society in society. You can't think of society only in an in a elite campus. Just because we are sitting here doesn't mean we are only sitting here. A little of this is already outside. I believe so. Uh, and JNU is struggling to get outside. But of course, uh, JNU's problem is that the vice chancellor there uh, has closed all gates and is doing something which is, uh, I mean, in traditional political language, uh, pure dictatorial uh, violence. So JNU has uh, problems of another kind, I mean, at a, another level of intensity today. Uh, I'll not talk about that unless you want me to talk about it. But, uh, but I, think, I, think, I think these spaces are all struggling to break their own gates not 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 simply to as a as a as a uh, as a uh, against against those who are locking those gates the authorities but uh, they are trying to break their own locked gates um, so uh, social criticism uh, can only happen when you break your own locks so i think students are also breaking some of their own locks and this is also very concrete i don't want to talk in terms of uh, numbers and identity numbers but i think for the first time across uh, different educational spaces this JNU, uh, uh, even 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 uh, Calcutta Centre and the IITs, it is a section of society which is which is taking the lead or whose voice is being heard uh, with 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 a kind of originality. Uh, whether it's Ambedkar's voice to Rohit's voice to some other voices, uh, which have not been heard even within these elite institutions before. And insofar as these are not elite voices, the institution is also now not uh, simply elite like it was earlier. That is my response. Right. Yeah, but any other, any other questions, sir? I'd, I'd really love to hear from you. Uh, not to me, to ask me anything, but uh, use me to say whatever you have. Sorry that. Hi, thank you. Sorry I came a little late, but what you were saying is very, very important. I was wondering, uh, uh, you, you talked about humanity, uh, the idea of humanity and the way we need to think about society. My, my issue and then the problem with Hinduism, that the kind of contradiction it has. But similar contradictions exist in Buddhist also. I mean, if you look at the Myanmar and the way they are dealing with Rohingyas, so the answer I don't think we'll be able to find in, in either Buddhism or, or Hinduism, an old kind of Hinduism. Yeah. So I was wondering is, how do we rethink in this process the idea of education and 
and the and, and something which I have been reading, I have been reading Gramsci seriously. So something about politics in the name of anyone, which doesn't seem to happen, in the sense the politics is so is it either personal or politics in the name of anyone. I mean people in Africa, for example, for for in much 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 worse condition than we can imagine. So how how do we how does how can that politics emerge? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a that's a very serious question also. Uh, see, I think I think too just because it's in two parts. First is Buddhism. I completely agree with you. I mean, I don't think anyone can give a kind of make a declaration that any choice of a particular path of thinking, including its ideology, in the name of a Buddha. Uh, which is Buddhism then uh, is a recipe is, is a is is a is a guarantee or is a, it's 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 a uh, it's a permanent solution to all future conflict all violence all injustice all atrocity no of course not of course not uh, uh, what has happened in Sri Lanka or is happening in Sri Lanka what is happening has happened in Burma and in other places again I don't have to again and again take Ambedkar's uh, take recourse to Ambedkar to, to justify uh, what I am saying, but just as a matter of um, uh, you know, just as a matter of um, opening up the archive in a in a in a completely um, a frank way, you know, in an egalitarian spirit. Now, uh, Ambedkar Ambedkar uh, spoke of Buddhism before he wrote the Buddha and his Dhamma and before the conversion uh, in a in an essay on future of Buddhism. He criticized the Buddhist order, the history of Buddhist. Sangha in a unsparing way, unsparing way. So there are two points here. He did adopt a Buddhism. He did take Buddha as his teacher, just like he took Pule as his teacher and Kabir. But he did it in his own on his own feet and with his own voice. This I think we must not forget. Ambedkar, what did Ambedkar say in Annihilation of Caste? He believed that religion is important. Why? Not because of theology. On the contrary, Ambedkar said that I have no interest in theology. But he did believe and he had a right to believe. You, we might not agree with Ambedkar and we have a right not to agree with Ambedkar. That religion is an essential form of social solidarity. Yeah, But he believed this very strongly. Now, he also said, which religion? Which kind of religion? And he made a distinction between a religion of what he called rules, habits, prescriptions, which are followed through an, uh, a process which is mechanical, which is imitative, which is like you are doing it and I am doing it because you are doing it. Why are you doing it? Because someone else is doing it. Why is that person doing it? Because someone else is doing it. And so it goes, a kind of graded imitation across the field of society such that this whole field comes together in some form which no one quite knows how to think about. So everyone is blind to that form and yet everyone is participating in that form which we call Brahmanism. Yeah? So Hindu society is essentially, its blind spot is Brahmanism which structures it. So what is its blind spot is what makes it. Yeah? Against this kind of religion he spoke of, religion of responsibility, for which he said that religion based on principles. Now, he also went on to say that the principle could be a wrong principle, but it would be a principle which we would take responsibility for, a principle in our own voices, not in the voice of some other and other and some abstract reality which no one knows what it is. No one knows what Hindu is and everyone kills and shouts that I am a Hindu, I am Hindu. Yeah? And it's not true only of Hindu. It can be Buddhist. It can be anything. You are completely... It can be Marxist. Absolutely. Ambedkar said, instead of that, religion, yes, but religion of principles. Now comes the most important part. Now with Buddha, Ambedkar read Buddha and he said that, look, in Buddha, when I read him, I find some principles. So one such principle is equality, fundamental equality, not equality which is only economic, 
piecemeal social no equality which is fundamental which is that we are equal hence we must become equal it's not that by becoming equal we will finally be equal that will never happen because in some respect someone will be different from someone else so difference cannot be raised and difference must not be raised and yet difference will always remain a force of inequality unless you begin with some kind of a commitment that we are equal and this is found in buddha so the idea the principle of equality and you also found the principle of love now the question is and that is where a misunderstanding starts a lot of ambedkarite thinking also says okay very good buddhist which is religion in some senses what religion is a kind of sangha is a kind of dhamma it's a kind of organization so it is a kind of religious equality now ambedkar would i think never agree with that he would say equality is neither religious nor economic nor social religious is a principle that we enunciate it's a principle that we with our minds so again rohit's words man was never thought of as a mind which means what man was never thought of as someone who is capable of thinking of principles so we take our principles from some bhagwan se aayega kisi aur se aayega great man se aayega ya mere father se aayega lekin main nahi de sakta principle kyun because we think of ourselves as obedient as submissive as 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 already dominated well to to enunciate a principle is to be free yeah so ambedkar's point was as human beings which i in my book which is going to come out soon i've called it a research program an untouchable research program in ambedkar's untouchable research program untouchable because he was an untouchable research program because he was creating a new research program and that's the second point for everyone and that research program was a program to find principles of society to make society in on your own responsibility in your own voice through your own thinking through your own mind through and through your mind which is a body and a set of bodies that is ourselves we do those things and then we take the responsibility also of adopting it through a religion yeah now that does not make it religious so i if i would put it like that ambedkar taught us or we can be we can teach ourselves through ambedkar not to think of religion only religiously we can think of religion socially materialistically through principles through ideas and ideas you're right is not for me or you it is for anyone yeah ideas are both universal but ideas always come through specific forms specific channels of experience so uh, what i will call a dalit aristocracy so dalit because the dalit experience is is the root through which the new idea of equality is coming whether ambedkar some some others rohit the specific names can be you know pole of course can be can be arranged that's not the most important thing but the important thing is it is coming through a certain historical and contemporary channel of experience which is dalit but it is coming such that it is in your words quite rightly it is it is a ground for anyone and when someone becomes a kind of a, a, a kind of uh, uh, a kind of uh, host a kind of host opens the dalit can, can and and has and must open her house to anyone then he or she is the biggest aristocrat only aristocrats can open their houses to anyone only they have the means so this is what i call a dalit aristocracy in the same way that a philosopher has spoken of proletariat aristocracy in another context yeah uh, so this 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 aristocracy is not the aristocracy aristocracy of the aristocrats it's the aristocracy who hitherto till now has been thought of as the least as the one having no existence and in that sense in the negative sense in the in the in the in the sense of being dalit that is crushed oppressed anyone so i i agree with you there i agree with you there yes
Your question. No, I just wanted to clarify one thing that any one thing I was I was thinking of of politics, politics doing politics in the name of anyone. The problem with I see the politics now is that sometimes it is very identity based, and it just kind of of self. It's kind of navel gazing, kind of that kind of politics, and we see a lot of that. So to kind of counter it and to think about politics and I'm thinking of Gramsci here is that when he suggests that politics in the name of anyone so sitting here I could be doing politics in the name of African people who are so how what kind of politics that that's yeah, yeah. Uh, Gramsci uh, since you mentioned Gramsci, uh, Gramsci a couple of times see Gramsci uh, I spoke about it though I didn't take his name see Gramsci was speaking of a kind of politics which is only possible within formal conditions of a kind of uh, a, a kind of early democracy, a kind of early uh, idea of some kind of formal equality between anyone and anyone else. Yeah, but not a real equality. Now this is exactly what Ambedkar in his Constituent Assembly speech talked of: that we have formal equality, but we do not formal democracy, but we do not have substantive social equality. So now there are two questions. Either this social equality path can be a political path to hegemony, counter hegemony, basically counter hegemony, yeah. And this can be done by anyone, vis-a-vis -vis anyone. So this 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 is not something which is only limited to the so-called organic logic, yeah. Because democracy, by its very logic, is universalistic. But but in a particular society where Democracy is blocked, not just by the fact that at this point there is still social inequality, but that there is a structure fundamentally anti-democratic in that very society which is formally democratic, which is caste. Because caste is formally anti-democratic. It is not just contingently anti-democratic. So we, we, I mean, it is a fool and a, and, and a, and a uh, uh, opportunistic fool who thinks that धीरे धीरे हो जाएगा सब ठीक वो टाइम के साथ हो जाता है पहले बुरी बुरा समय था अब तो हम 21st सेंचुरी में हैं वो सब कास्ट वास्ट के बारे में बात मत करो ये ऑपरेशनिज्म और और बेवकूफी दोनों साथ है क्योंकि फंडामेंटली जो एंटी डेमोक्रेटिक है वो खुद ब खुद डेमोक्रेटिक नहीं हो सकता है बिकॉज़ इन बिटवीन देयर मस्ट बी अ डेमोक्रेटिक रेवोल्यूशन व्हाट दैट रेवोल्यूशन विल बी इज द क्वेश्चन विल इट बी सफिशिएंट टू बी अ काउंटर हेजेमोनिक पाथ टू द रेवोल्यूशन आई डू नॉट थिंक सो that is why i would at this stage differentiate between an ambedkarite revolution and a gramscian thought of revolution that is my reply yeah any question yeah question uh, i i would like to say uh, thanks to you for coming and addressing us when you are talking a uh, lot of things actually gave us kind of confidence because past like 25 days when we are like staying here and then protesting Uh, the administration and the faculty, even the non-teaching staff or the security, the language which they used it is like unacceptable things, and which is very in the public discourse also. And it is kind of for me personally, it's a contradictory uh, situation created here because in the classroom when we have a discussion, they say that we should raise voice, we should stand uh, for the marginalized communities and. we are here as an institute we are here for the social justice and we are working for the marginalized when we as a students who are already marginalized and asking that like the future generation that they should not be depressed on the basis of their identity and the social status then the, the power hierarchies came into place they imposed their power and in order to prove that what the pedagogy or the pattern of raising our voice is questioned by using the power they even the administrative have circulated an uh, information through emails and uh, send a circulars that actually break the unity which you are talking uh, in your uh, things so as a students when we are uh, the most powerless and oppressed on based on different aspects that based on gender based on our caste based on even the way we dress and i had this experience on the day one in the classroom at emphil space uh, space they 
they just just judge you the way you dress and they take that to give examples that itself humiliates and i am getting emotional every time because those lived experiences are very horrible at our higher educational stage yesterday we are having a discussion on spo social protection officer and then people are when they are like telling their experiences at higher educational things somewhere we feel that this space is not for us and and the very purpose of having a educational space is to take out those inequalities or in these insecure feelings which we created but here we can see that how this power and the position exercising on us and it is very difficult to contradict if somebody with my my own level my friends or classmates i would easily argue with them i easily fight with them for my own you know voice but when it is coming from the you know authority like in the faculty when i raise questions i'll be at, my career will be at stake either i will be failed at masters level either i will be least given least priority in the placements and i would be at like always talked or under surveillance till till before the protest nobody knows our names nobody knows which course we are in since we are raising our voice we are targeted by name we are targeted at the school level we are targeted at this course level and and that is where we actually this protest also brought kind of you know Uh, solidarity among us i never expect this would be a place where i can at least have some memories i past one year i was like having very difficult time to stay here i am i'm i studied here in hcu for 6 years i mean that is like kind of that i had different imagine of the institute but like many students who come from the marginalized communities they have this conflict Uh, whatever i'm talking is right or not even when i'm like telling my experience now i'll question am i talking academically right or politically right or the language i am using the body language i am using right or not is it right whether to put put my emotions in the public space or not everything is individually questioned and which actually kills certain times voice i and it is very difficult to put like everything in the written form i'm very bad at writing i i don't know some so how to face you know how, how to uh, like face this kind of oppression when we talk about you know oppression discrimination marginalization on the basis of our identity the forms are being changed now they are allowing us to sit in the classroom i will be allowed i'm i'm a scheduled class student but i will be allowed sit in the same classroom and utilize the ac and all whatever facilities but the kind of treatment and the kind of you know uh, platform which created that have been changed so how to tackle this thing it is kind of everyday struggle which have the effect on our work which we do it. it it definitely have that quality of work or even this quality of life we have it here at the space it is very traumatic space so how to encounter this kind of things especially in terms of gender aspects the the language which they have used the you know the way they behave when we are like at the front place when we actually many of the women who are part of the women are like at every level got humiliated so how to handle this kind of things is a uh, kind of thing and i would like to say thank you so much but whenever you are talking i'm like looking at you and then i'm like collecting all of these things kind of support like it actually gave me an assurance that what i am doing all these days is right and i have right to do it and the way i am doing is like acceptable and thank you so much sir for coming and addressing us No, no. I, I am the one who should thank you for for asking me to come here and giving me this space to talk to you. Uh, what can I say? You are right, but within within the little time that you spoke, 
you had tears in your eyes, but you also smiled. Uh, uh, and and uh, you had a sm so uh, this this is this is the this is the, uh, the truth the truth of of being not in a classroom and not in the comfort of, uh, of of a private surrounding whether it be a home or uh, or, or 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 anything which is which is uh, simply simply uh, meant for uh, uh, which is exclusionary which is basically exclusionary meant for a few and from which most are everyone else is excluded thrown out uh, it is in this kind of a space that in a matter of five minutes you can cry, weep, think, sing, and as I said, be silent and remain in solitude, but in a in a in a in a solidarity of solitude, in a kind of public solitude. Uh, and that I have been given a little uh, room in this solitude is something I am very grateful to all of you for. Uh, uh, and then what uh, the questions, the, the 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 experiences that you talked about? I know, I know, I know from the from the other side. No, as a, as a person who is in a position of authority and power, uh, I know exactly uh, how how uh, terrible and terribly dangerous this relationship, this relationship between uh, the the particular the teacher and the student is and can become. Uh, for two reasons at least. One is the structure itself which is based on the teacher who is supposed to know and the student who is supposed to, as I said, apprentice, someone who has to learn. So the assumption is already she doesn't know. We begin with she doesn't know and already I know. And so between knowledge and lack of knowledge there is, uh, there is a fundamental symbolic hierarchy and, and, and cultural hierarchy and intellectual hierarchy. Uh, which, which then immediately moves to the next level. And that I think is deadly, it is murderous. It is murderous, it murders. Which is that if you do not know, then you are also not capable of knowing. And I, who have learned what I, have, what I know now through actually the same process of education through which you are coming, which you have come to now, I already knew. I knew by right, the right of the fact that I belong to a certain kind of background, or caste, a set of privileges. So everything is pre-decided. The one who doesn't know and the one who knows this relationship, which is not a relationship, it is actually a pseudo-relationship, is most emphatically incarnated or ca uh, is lived out in the gender relationships in patriarchy. So between father and daughter, between husband and wife, between brother and sister, and then between men and women. Men as the ones who know, and the women the ones who are not, who merely don't know, who are not capable of knowing, not to that extent. So yes, now women are educated or becoming educated. Some of them do so well. They win, you know, they, 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 they get first, first class, they, get, they stand first in class, they even get fantastic fellowships. But still, as, as, a, as a people, as a capacity, not to the extent men do. So, and this, this is something which, which uh, between men and women, and then of course between Shudra and Brahman, and between working, working people and the master, the technicist and the unskilled wage laborer, in different spaces, but particularly in the family, particularly through the family in the gender space, in the gender matrix. This intellectual hierarchy is as serious as the other hierarchy which is clearly physical. And the two are the same because I don't believe intelligence is disembodied. Intelligence is lived out in, like you said, in what you say, in how you dress, in the gestures you make. And everything is being judged. Everything is being evaluated in terms of who you are. So it's not just a question of fitting in or not fitting in. It's a question of permanent exclusion, discrimination, based on a, a judgment that this is who you are. And that is murder. That is what is uh, murder of your being, ontological murder. Murder of not just the body, but murder, again to come back to Rohit's word, never was man taken to be a mind, which means never were men and women and that is men and women from specific 
in specific locations taken to be minds taken to be intelligences taken to be capable of thinking and this thinking is always reflected through science of the body and this is what you just now so movingly spoke of but it was it was you after all who said it and i can only respond in very very unsatisfactory and partial ways you said it fully I, uh, what can i say after this all i can say is that uh, to you and everyone else whether seen through caste or seen through gender or every other category and more than that through the social human humanity of which all of us are meant to be a part uh, we we must we must give each other strength uh, and we must also uh, have the have the have the uh, sense of restraint not to and this is something i really admire about what's happening here not to uh try and believe that even in the space of this agitation some of us can uh lead some others or some of us can tell someone else uh how to think about the demands we are making uh, so, so a true egalitarian uh, uh environment would be created and i'm sure it is created here